that he's reigning in me. You may be seated. I'm going right into the message. everybody doing? Doing all right tonight on this Wednesday night? All right. If you got your Bible, I hope you do, or you got your smartphone or your iPad or your Bible source. I hope you open it up to John chapter 11. I've always been annoyed at the the thought that um, the enemy's always tried to hijack supernatural things and distort it and corrupt it and make it so it's something people are afraid of instead of embracing and you know, and I've always, I've always been annoyed at that. And, and you know, one thing I've realized about things when it comes to the supernatural, when it comes to walking by faith and living this life for Jesus, one thing that I've realized is that things aren't always what they seem. Not always what they seem. Times when you think things aren't working out, doesn't look like it's going to come through, doesn't seem like things are going to happen, things that you've been believing for, praying for, Uh, you know, coming to God for things that you have just really been going after, using your faith for. Sometimes they don't look like they're going to happen and and you're wondering if it ever will, but yet then God still comes through. And 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 I've always, I've always been just uh, excited about this. And and I've got a, I've got something in John 11 that I believe is going to help us out tonight. Uh, um, How many of you, by a show of hands, would say that you could, you could use a touch of God or you could use a touch of the supernatural in your life. There's some things going on that you can't do naturally and you need some supernatural breakthroughs. And see, I'm in, that, I'm in that same group right now too. I need a touch from God. I need some supernatural things to take place. I need some miracles. Maybe some, some of you have prayed and things haven't happened yet. Maybe some of you have spoke your faith. Things haven't happened yet. You know, you've been hoping things would come past, th- hoping things would come through and they haven't quite yet. And you need a supernatural touch from God tonight. You need something to break through. I'm hoping and I believe that the story about the mis- miracle of Lazarus, and he is a guy who was dead for four days. Everybody say four days. This guy was dead for four days before God acted. And I believe that this story is going to speak to you tonight. It's my belief that God will cause things in your life, things that you thought were maybe dormant, that were maybe dead, that were maybe delayed, that God will cause these things to be resurrected in Jesus' name. Bow your heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now in Jesus' name. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it's alive. And so, Lord Jesus, we open our hearts to your life tonight, to your word. Speak to us, stir in us, change us, transform us. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Flood, if you guys got to go to class, head on out right now. All right, we're going to start in verse 1 of John chapter 11. Now, Scripture says this. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. And he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Verse 2 says, This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Verse 3, So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one that you love is sick. Now I want you to pause right there for a second. I want you to put yourself you know, in this moment, in this story, because what you can see going on here is that you've got a group of people, you've got some family who they are, there are some loved ones that are are in this moment, they're panicking because someone they love very dearly is sick and dying. So someone that they care for a great deal is about to die. And so essentially they're saying, Jesus, listen, you've done miracles before. We've seen it happen. Why don't you do another one for us right here, right now? We could use one right about now. Because our good friend, our brother, he's, he's dying and we need you, okay? So, so Jesus, we need you to show up. This is a, if there was ever a time, Jesus, that we needed you, now is that time. We can keep, keep reading here. And Jesus, when he heard this, verse 4, when he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness, it will not, what? Everybody say this, everybody say this with me. This sickness will not end in death. Let's say this again. This sickness will not end in death. The sickness won't end in death. In other words, it's looking bad right now. 
but it's not going to turn out the way you think. Things aren't always what they seem. Things aren't always what they appear. This sickness won't end in death. He said, no, it's for what? It's for God's glory. It's for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. It's as almost as if Jesus is saying, okay, things don't look good. I, I give you that. Things don't look good right now, but they don't look good according to your timetable. They don't, go look, they don't look good according to your perception, according to what you're looking at right now. But what you've got to understand is that there is a divine strategy that I've got that's, that's something that you may not be able to see right now. Something you may not understand right now, but there is a strategy, something going on behind the scenes that when I'm through with this, everybody's going to look and say, Jesus has been here. There's not going to be any question, there's not going to be any denying that Jesus showed up, that Jesus was involved, that Jesus had changed and touched and, and healed. And he's saying, this is, this is something that's happened. And there are some of you here right now, and maybe you're facing some things that you've been beat up and you've been bruised, you've been knocked around a little bit. Maybe some of it is self-inflicted because you made bad decisions or you had a bad reaction to a situation in your life and, and you should have said something nice, but you said something mean and you caused more damage. Or maybe there's some things going on in your life, sickness and addictions or different things going on, and you've been wondering, is God there? What's really going on? Is God here? Well, I I believe that God is speaking to you tonight through this scripture saying, no matter what you're going through, this sickness or your situation will not end in death. It will not end in death. God has a divine strategy. God is always up to something. Things aren't always what they seem. You didn't think God was there. God, you didn't, you know, you prayed and it seemed like God wasn't answering. But see, God is always up to something. He's always got a divine strategy. This sickness is not going to end in death. In other words, he's saying, in fact, it's going to be so undeniable that when I came, when I show up, it's going to be so undeniable that the hand of God was involved. Now, everybody's going to look and say that only Jesus could have done this. This isn't something that man could have done. And see, that's how God, that's how God works. God doesn't want to work in a way that when, whenever he looks at your situation, you, 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 it could, could have been God or it just maybe could have been your, you know, you, what you did or something somebody did for you. No. When God shows up, God's going to get the glory. God's going to get the glory for it. This sickness will not end in death. Now, speaking of death, I'm a bit curious. Of course, tomorrow is what? <laughs> TC's birthday, which is way more important than Halloween, all right? Um, so anyway, speaking, <laughs> I was speaking of death, all right? Speaking of death, and, and, and again, like I said before, I've always been annoyed at the fact that the enemies tried to hijack hijack supernatural things, all right? How many of you are, are, are slightly twisted in the mind and you actually enjoy scary movies? It's okay, and don't be all weird on me, I know. All right, you don't have to hold them up. If you're, if you're a little ashamed, you can like raise them and put them down real quick or maybe point at me so nobody else can see. I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed. I love scary movies, all right? My wife will tell you that I, I, I love them. I think they're awesome and I think they're fun. All right. And, and again, don't get all weird on me with Halloween here because the only ghost that lives in my house is the Holy Ghost, all right? Let's... I saw that on Facebook. I had to use it tonight. It was so corny, but I loved it, all right? This is true, all right? Um, but but uh, if you're like me, you like, some of the, you like some of the scary movies. How many of you like those? You're the kind of person that talks back on the screen. You talk back. Like, um, you know that if there's a basement in a house, and you, you know in a scary movie, don't go in the basement, all right? That's like a rule. Don't go in the basement. How many of you are like, don't go in the... You see somebody starting to walk down the stairs. They find, like, this secret entrance. They pop a door open, and they start to walk, and you're like... Don't go downstairs. How many of you talk back at the TV? Yeah, yeah, that's how we are. We're talking back like, don't go downstairs. What are you stupid? You know, you're just, anyway, everything bad always happens downstairs in the basement. All right, but well, anyway, I want to play a little game, a little, little fun tonight. I'm, I'm going to play a couple tunes, and we're going to see if you guys recognize some of these scary movies, because I want you thinking about this, all right? Um, and so if you know it, let's just, just shout out the movie. You don't need to raise your hand. I'm not going to call on you. Already. Just shout it out if you recognize it. I want to have a little fun for just a moment here. Let's see how good you guys are, okay? You ready back there? Let's go with the first song. Let's see what you see if you know this. One. Very, very good. Jaws. That was an easy one. I figured you guys would get this. That was probably the most recognized one, all right? Um, it's the song that made it impossible for us to ever truly enjoy beaches ever again. But anyway, all right, let's do this one. Uh, here's the next one, all right? And this one is a, this one's a scary one, all right? I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna lie. This one's a scary one, all right? Let's play this next one. Number two. Yeah. 
Yeah, this one is actually called Halloween. Now, you can stop it because it makes me nervous playing that right now, right? I play a song like that. If some of you need counseling or extra prayer, we'll do it after church, all right? Now, the third one here, this is by far the scariest song of, of all Halloween, scary songs. That nothing even tops or comes close to this one, all right? And let's see if you can figure this out. Be, be prepared here, okay? This is scary. You can't take it, I understand. It's pretty scary. Wait for it. All right. <laughs> Some of y'all were starting to move. I had to cut it out. <laughs> One of the scariest songs of all time. What is it? Yeah, Ghostbusters. There you go. All right. Now, another scary movie that I liked, and there was a line in this movie that I've, I've, I've used before, but there, it was actually one of my favorite scary movies, and it's not a new movie. It's an older movie. All right. Anybody ever see or like the movie Sixth Sense? The Sixth Sense, right? You had a little boy, and you had Bruce Willis, and then Bruce Willis, his character was actually dead, and he was a ghost, didn't even realize it, and I just ruined the movie if you haven't seen it, but sorry. It's old. You should have seen it by now. All right, there is this line in this movie, there's this line in this movie that, the, that he says, this little boy says, and it, is so, it was so creepy when you first saw it, all right? Anybody remember the line? I yeah. I see dead people. <laughs> Super creepy, right? Coming from a little kid, I see dead people. Now, there's something that a lot of you don't know about pastors that I'm going to share. Dad's here, Pastor Daryl's here, and so he can, you know, he can uh, agree with this. Pastors, we go to school and we actually do have superpowers. It's true. You didn't realize this, but pastors do. We do have superpowers, okay? Like, like for example, um, one of the superpowers that we have is um, uh, when I start to study my Bible, there are occasionally my Bible will hover. See, y'all don't know to take me serious or not right now, and it's really making me happy. I'm just joking, by the way, okay? So you don't have to look at me all crazy, all right? But it's true. We do have superpowers, all right? It's, one of them is a, that is one of them. Another one is this, that um, pastors, we don't have any red lights. It's, it's true. God is like, since you're a pastor, every time we pull up to a stoplight, it just automatically turns green. It's like a pretty, pretty sweet gift. It's pretty amazing. Um, I can be standing out there talking with you out there in the hallway or the lobby after church, and God will instantly reveal all of the bad things you've done all this past week. <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> Superpowers. You didn't know it. Now you do. All right. But another power, and, and, and I'm serious about this one, and this is true. We do see, we do see dead people. We see them everywhere we go. I go to the mall, I see dead people. I go to the grocery store, which I hate to go, and I see dead people. I come to church, I see dead people. I see dead people everywhere I go. And I try not to, but it's just something that because I've given my heart and life to Jesus to the point where he uses me to reach people, everywhere we go, we do see people who we think are dead. And if you're taking notes tonight, I want you to write this down. This is a key thought. If you're taking notes, write this down. Because did you know that you can still be dead even though you're alive? You can be dead while you live. Alive on the outside, but very, very dead. Very, very dormant on the inside. See, I see dead people, and, and if you were to be honest, so do you. Not in a spooky, weird Halloween movie kind of way, but in a very real, supernatural kind of way. We do see dead people all the time. First Timothy 5, 6. I want you all to help me out. Look at this on the screen and, and, and say this with me. The widow who lives for pleasure, what is she? She is dead even while she what? Even while she lives. Even while she lives. See, we see dead people. Maybe you see people who are relationally dead. People who haven't given their very best to relationships and they've just been kind of surfacy with what they're doing and that never been, there's never been real trust. There's never been authentic transparency. There's never been, you know, coming together and, and you see this. There are people who are dead in those kind of relationships and, and go through that. I see people who are married and they're dead. Their marriages are dead. They're they're. they're Good Lord, they're basically roommates. I see this all the time. I see people who are struggling in their faith, and they're dead in their faith. And instead of just, you know, giving their hearts and all to God, they've given up. And they come to church, and they're very alive on the outside, but dead on the inside. I, I see people who have been struggling with addictions, and they've given up. They've lost hope. I see so many dead people. So many people struggling. Alive on the outside, but dead on the inside. You know, and as we talk about the story of Lazarus, Lazarus died, okay? He was dead, and, and maybe there's something on the inside of you, a hope or a faith or a dream or a belief or a relationship or something that is on the inside of you. There is something that has died. 
Something you've given up on. Something that it appears to be dead. But see, things aren't always what they appear. Remember that. Quickly, we'll summarize this story and then we'll get into it. And I'm going to tell you what happened, all right? All right, between verses 5 and 16, all right? And you can read all the details on your own time. Jesus, he heard his good friend Lazarus, had, uh, he was dying. And then Lazarus actually did die. And so Jesus, he waited two days before he left to go on this journey to see this man that he loved, his dear friend. Two days he waited, all right? And then he said, when he said to his disciples, we need to go back um, to Judy, uh, Judea where Lazarus was, his disciples said, um, Jesus, you remember the last time we went there, they tried to kill us. That's probably not a good idea to go back to the place where the people want you dead. And so, and so they're not in agreement there. Um, they're like, Jesus, you know, here, good, there, bad. Let's not do this. Um, Jesus said, no, you don't understand. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Now he's, he's referring to him dying, but he says, we're going to go wake him up. We've got to go wake him up, all right? And so they're traveling, and when they do, we're going to see three different characters in this story. Three different people who are alive on the outside, but on the inside, there's something very dead. Something, something that on the inside I would say was, was, was dead, or what I would consider a death trap. Something that you and I could probably relate to, you know, maybe one or more of these even in our own life. And we're going to start by looking at these. And the first one I want to look at is this, is this person, Thomas. How many of you, how many of you know what Thomas is known for in the Bible? Doubting. In fact, we usually refer to him as what? Doubting Thomas. How horrible would it be to be known as Doubting Thomas? Insert your first name after doubting, you know, Doubting Josh. How horrible would it be? But that's what he's known for, all right? So Thomas was known for doubting. And if you're taking notes, all right, this one's not going to surprise you. Thomas was dead in his doubts. He was dead in his doubts. Now, I'm going to read a little bit more into this, admittedly. And so, but uh, because in this context of the story, disciples, they just said, let's go, you know, let's not go back there to Judea because, you know, they'll kill you. But, but it's very likely that in this next verse, verse 16, that Thomas is being a little bit sarcastic. All right, but here's what he said. Then Thomas, John eleven sixteen. 16, then Thomas called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, oh, okay, let's go back also so that we can die with him. In other words, things are going bad. Well, let's make it worse and let's die too. Lazarus is dead. Well, let's all go back and let's die with him. Doubting Thomas. Dead in his doubts. You know, it's, it's like this. There are a lot of people who have spiritual doubts. And I relate to the little boy when we were talking about basements. I relate to the little boy sometimes um, who had, with the story of the basement or the story of the pantry, right? There was this little boy, and he was afraid of his basement. And his mom, that's where they kept all of their canned goods. They kept it downstairs in the pantry, in the basement. This boy was so afraid and so scared to go down into that pantry. Every time. So his mom would say, hey, listen, I need you to go downstairs into the basement and I need you to get something for me. He's like, mom, why would you ask me to go down there? I'm scared to go down there. There's, you know, there's, there's, no, I'm, I'm afraid to go downstairs. How about you not ask me? Then she's like, listen, you need to stop being afraid. I need a can of soup. I need you to go downstairs, man up, go downstairs and get that can of soup. And he said, mom, I'm too afraid. And she finally stopped and just said, listen, don't you know Jesus is everywhere? Okay, so Jesus is with you. Jesus is in the basement. And he was like, Jesus is in the basement? She said, yes. So he was like, all right. So he opens that door to the basement and he yells downstairs, hey, yo, Jesus, if you're down there, won't you throw me up a can of tomato soup? <laughs> right? Just because he's there, it doesn't always feel as if he is. All right? Just because he is, just because, you know, there are a lot of us here that have prayed and we've been reaching out and we've been using our faith and sometimes it seems like heaven's silent. Sometimes it seems like things aren't working and you're wondering, you know, I'm praying and God, what's really happening? God, I'm reaching out to you. What's going on here? You know, if you're there, are you real? And if you're real, are you good? And if you're good, you know, then are you there? If you're there, then, you know, do something about it. If you can do something about it, why don't you? And a lot of us, our doubts, our spiritual doubts aren't in God's ability to do it. It's not can you, God, it's will you, God. A lot of us believe God can, but a lot of us just don't believe he'll do it for us. We have these spiritual doubts. And there are a lot of you, just like Thomas, dying in your doubts. Second person. you got another person involved in the story. Martha. And there are a lot of you that are going to be able to relate to Martha. Martha was dead, if you're note-taking, Martha was dead in her delay. 
dead in her delay. All right, what was the problem? The problem was this. It was taking Jesus too long to get anything done, and she's about to let everybody know how she feels. Look at verse 17, John eleven seventeen. 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for how long? He had been in there for four days. Dead for four days. All right? Now, you've got dead and then you've got dead dead. All right? Like, you've got dead, like, for example, whenever you're watching a movie and Batman gets trapped and he gets hammered and gets shot, okay, you're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, Batman's dead. No, Batman's not dead. Okay, he's going to pop up and he's going to start whipping some tail. Or how many of you were fans of the movie of the show 24 when it was on? Jack Bauer. Jack Bauer died all the time, and you just knew somebody was going to give him a shot, and the guy's going to pop back up and just start shooting people again. All right, you've got dead, but then you've got dead, dead. All right, four days later, that's dead, dead. Okay, he was really dead. In fact, in the King James, and I use this all the time for my kids. All right, the King James, it honestly says, he stinketh. Actually, we added the word F, stinketh. And I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, God, you stinketh. And I go all King James on them, all right? That cracks me up. He stinketh. Anyway, verse 21, all right? Let's just look at this. Verse 21, and here's the delay. Um, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you, had, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What took you so long? You could have been here, you could have been here a day and a half, and it took you four days. What were you thinking? Could have been here in a day and a half, and it took you four days. What were you thinking? She's dead in her delay. Dead in her delay. And there's some of you that are able to relate to this tonight, because I know so many great godly people who had this deep desire to do things of God, and because it didn't happen in this timetable, this time frame that they wanted, that they had pressured on God, they gave up on God. They ditched their dream, they trashed what God had telling them to, was telling them to do, and they quit. And just quit. There's so many people who, who are dead and their delays. So many people, you know, give up on relationships, give up on dreams, give up on hopes, give up on faith, give up on God coming through. And because it doesn't happen when you want it to happen, you believe that God isn't there. Or be- believe that God doesn't care, that your faith obviously doesn't work, or that things aren't going to work out for you, and maybe God will do it for somebody else, but he's not going to do it for me. Dead in your delays. And I know a lot of people who are believing God for their physical bodies to be healed. Sickness is to be healed. And, and, and they pray and they come to a service and it doesn't happen instantly, so they think that God's miracle working power is dead. It's over. It doesn't happen. It doesn't work anymore. Dead and their delays. One of the saddest things is whenever I see someone who is believing God for someone that they love very, very much, believing for their salvation and believing for them to come into the kingdom of God and get to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And they pray and then they come back and they say, well, you know, every time I pray for them, it seems like they get further from God. And they stop praying and they back off and don't you know the delay dead in the delay why the delay there are a lot of us that are dead in our delay and because god hasn't come through well then obviously god's not going to do it that's what we start believing you know so you have thomas who was dead in his doubts you have martha who's dead in her delay and you have a third character mary and this is probably one of the most difficult if you're taking notes mary was dead in her discouragement Dead in her discouragement. And there's a lot of us are going to be able to relate to this tonight. Look in verse 20. Check her out. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet Jesus. But what did Mary do? Mary just stayed at home. Mary just stayed home. I mean, can't you just feel the discouragement from this verse? Why even bother? He's dead. Jesus didn't show up. What's the point? You know, nothing's going to happen. There's no use for me to believe. There's no use for me to read. There's no use for me to pray anymore. Nothing's going to happen anyway. Dead in her discouragement. See, guess what? I see dead people all the time. Dead people in their discouragement. So discouraged. What's the point of going to church? Nothing's going to change. Nothing's going to be different. Nothing's going to happen. What's the point of being volunteering extra? I'm just going to be tired. It's never going to change for me. Nobody's going to appreciate me. What's the point of reading my Bible? I'm just not going to understand it. Or what's the point of speaking my faith? Or what's my point of, what's the point of witness? Dead in discouragement. I see this all the time. I'm never going to be happy. Everybody else is going to be happy, but I'm not going to be happy. It doesn't work for me. Oh, yeah, you're the pastor. You got superpowers. You're so blessed. But me, it doesn't work for me. I've tried it. Didn't happen. Dead in discouragement. See it all the time. 
A question I'm going to ask everybody here, and I want you to be very, very honest, and I want you to ask yourself this question right now, all right? Is there something in your life right now that is either dead or dying? What in your life is either dead or dying? And I want you to be really honest. You know, is it your faith? Your faith, and it's, you know, at one time you had this real deep faith. At one time you had this strong, fierce faith, you know, ready to take on the enemy and ready to stand up. And things discouraged you and you backed off. Or maybe there was a time where you were more intimate with God than you are right now. And you were, you're, the Word of God was speaking to you and it was alive and it was fresh and it was real. And, and God was just moving and all of a sudden you know, you've, you've backed off because things started changing. Or you got busy or God, there were delays and things didn't happen when you wanted to. Or, you know, or could it be like there's so many people, you know, there's, you've, got, you've got things in your life like relationships. You know, where you were close to somebody and there was an argument or there was, a, there was a big breakup or there was a big issue that tore you apart and maybe you said some things that were harsh and they said some things that were harsh and, and now there's no forgiveness there and, and there's bitterness that's been grown and maybe some things have been going on and there's the relationships that are dead or dying. You know, what is it? You've you got to be honest with this. You know, maybe it's financially. Maybe you're the person that shows up and you've got the look, you've got the nice car, you've got the nice clothes, but you're dead in debt. What is it? You know, the reality is that we all make decisions. We all make decisions to change what we're going through. I don't want to be who I was last month or last year. or what I, I don't want to have the same problems that I had last year. I don't want to have the same struggles that I had last year or last month. I want to progress. I want to move forward. We all make these commitments to make these changes and to be different people and to step forward in our faith with God and to do these different things. But there's a lot of us that just continuously repeat the pain over and over and over again. And fall into the same traps over and over and over again. It's like this. It's like if, imagine a, a, having a lot of us are like a glass of water that's just so full of hurt and pain and struggles, things that we just carry around. And it's so full that just a little bit of a bump and all that water just starts to spill out on people. And that's how a lot of us carry. That's how a lot of us live. You know, you, you, it doesn't take much doesn't take a whole lot of movement before you start to spill over. You know, so you look, getting back into the story, look at verse 33, all right? There's a lot of tears going on right now. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of, there's a lot of tough, intense stuff going on right now. And Jesus is right here in the middle of it. Okay, we read this story and we, you know, we, we read through it so fast and we look and Jesus just comes in and saves the day and it's all not. There's a lot of pain involved here. And Jesus is right in the middle of it. Jesus saw Martha weeping. And the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. And, and he, was, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Deeply moved in spirit and troubled. I mean, Jesus was hurting as well. He's hurting too. Look in verse 34. Where have you laid him? He asked. Well, come and see, Lord, they replied. Verse 35. And what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? He wept. Jesus Wept. I mean, think about this. Think about the irony of this moment. All right, Jesus here, he's the Son of God, and he's about to do what? He's about to resurrect this man. He's, a, he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead and do an amazing, incredible miracle, miracle, all right? And he knew that at any moment he could do it. At any moment he has the power and the ability to raise Lazarus from the dead. But yet, in this moment right here, he was sad. He wept. Why? Why is that? It's because Jesus, at the very core of who he is, cares so much for you and I. He cares so much. This is how much he's weeping because he's hurting. He's weeping, he's crying because he's hurting. His people were hurting, the people he loved. See, you, you can break this Bible down all kinds of different ways, but it all boils down to a simple scripture in John. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. There's just nothing but pure love. 
You know, and the Bible says, where's Jesus today? Well, Scripture says that He's high and exalted. He's sitting at the right hand of God, all right, right beside our Heavenly Father as our advocate praying for us. And what that means is this. It means whenever you're hurting, He's hurting. It means whenever you're crying, He's praying. You know, there are times whenever you've got tears and you've got sadness and you've got struggles and you've got questions, and I promise you the one person... The one person in this whole world, this whole universe, who is taking matters seriously and who cares as much as anybody, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. You know, there are some of you that maybe you're in a season between the death and the power of resurrection, and you're stuck in this moment, this time of delay, and you don't see it, you don't feel it, you know, your doubts are are very, very real, and the delay is obvious. What you're going through, you're in a season of this delay right now, and it's, it's not easy, you know? Maybe you're in a season of discouragement right now, and, and during this time, if you're going through a season of doubt or you're going through a season of discouragement or a season of delay, I promise you this is the moment where if you'll allow Him and you won't bail, if you'll come to God, this is the moment where He'll hold you the tightest, it's during these moments where you feel him the most if you will let him. If you'll stay open to God's love and not cut him off and not get mad and I'm never going back and I'm not talking to these people. I'm not going to. This is something you've got to remember, especially for those of you in delays. And put this up there. If you're taking notes, you've heard this before. I'm going to repeat again. God's delays are not God's denials. You've got to remember that God's delays are not God's denials, all right? What, how long? Joseph was in prison for two years, or um, Moses wandered in the desert. Uh, you've got Paul who spent years and years waiting, making tents. You've got all of these people, Noah who built the ark and waited for it to rain. Every one of them had to deal with the delay, and God always came through. God's delays are not God's denials. Why did Jesus come? Why did he come? What was the point and purpose of Jesus coming? I'll tell you, it's so simple. He came so we could live. And you've got to remember that. Jesus came so that we could live. So that we could live this God kind of life. Not this watered down, washed down, you know, this, this uh, pathetic, exclusive pursuit of, of materialism and self-gratification and all these things that we've used to kind of substitute real Christianity and real li living for Jesus. He came so we could live this God kind of life. You know, not just this superficial thing. A real, real life in Christ. You know? And I'm talking about the kind of life that means this. It's, it's when you've got a joy on the inside when there is absolutely no reason at all why you should have it. Everybody else is looking at you like, why is there joy in this person? Well, it's because of Jesus. Or, or you've got peace in a moment where everything else is stress and turmoil and all you know, jacked up, but yet you've got a peace that passes understanding. That's what I'm talking about. A real God kind of life that even goes beyond this human ability to comprehend why you've even got it. How many of you have experienced, by a show of hands even, as kind of a witness and a testimony tonight, how many of you have experienced those moments where there was no earthly reason for you to have any kind of sense of peace or joy in your life, but yet because of Jesus, you had it? Look around. God kind of life. That's what he's talking about. Keeping in mind that Jesus, the Bible says that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that resurrection power is also in the inside of us. So why did God come? Why did Jesus come? So that we could live. John 10.10. 10. I want you to look at this real, real, real quick. All right. This is, this is, you could, there are two mission statements you could say in this passage of scripture. You've got Jesus' mission statement, but you've also kind of, you could arguably say, find the enemies. John 10.10. 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy but Jesus said this, but I've come that you may have life. Everybody say life. And I've come that you may have life and that you would have this life to its fullest. This God kind of life. If you're taking notes, write this down. Because Jesus came so we could live, stop dressing, acting like a dead man. Because Jesus came so that we could live, stop dressing like you belong in the tomb. 
Stop acting like you belong in the tomb. Stop thinking like a dead man. Stop being around dead people. Stop touching dead things. Because Jesus came so we could have life. What about death is attractive enough to leave life? What is so attractive about death that we would give up life? I don't get it. I don't get it. You know, stop dressing like a dead man. Stop the nonsense. It, Jesus said this. Look, look, at verse, look at verse 43. All right, getting back to the story. Jesus called out in a loud voice and he said, Lazarus, come out. So some of you in the King James, Lazarus, come forth. All right. The dead man came out and his hands and his feet were wrapped with strips of linen, cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off those grave clothes and let him go. In other words, take anything off that resembles death. Take it off. Take it off. Don't be around it. Anything that resembles death and who you are before the freedom of Christ, you don't want to have anything to do with it no longer. Take it off. Get rid of it. Get rid of the dead things. You were, Colossians 2.13 says, dead in your transgressions and sins, but now you're alive in Christ. Alive in Christ. Take off negative thoughts. Anything that are those dead negative thoughts, stop thinking them. Think Purpose, say, and do. A lot of times, that's how the enemy works in your life. You start thinking it, and then it becomes a purpose. You allow it in here so much that it becomes a part of who you identify yourself as. And at that point, there's just a short matter of time before you start to actually execute it and live it out. Get rid of the dead thoughts. Well, I'm never going to amount to anything. You know, or we're always going to be miserable, or we're always going to be in debt, or we're never going to have enough money, or we're never going to get through this, or, you know, that's okay for them, but that's not my thing, and it's going to work for them, and it's not going to work for me, or, you know, so you overcame something great. Every time I put my hand to something, it seems to fail, or I'm never going to amount to anything, or it's never going to happen, or God answers prayers for you, but I'm not sure He can answer prayers for me. Stop thinking dead thoughts. Get rid of it. Stop the death thinking. Stop the death speaking. Anything that resembles death, Jesus said, I came that you could have life and a full life. What is so great about death that it's worth speaking and giving up life? Nothing. <laughs> I'll answer that. Nothing. You know, if you've got a past, well, if you come to Jesus, the Bible says that your past is forgiven. And it's covered by the blood of Jesus. If you've got mistakes in, in your life, well, the Bible says that God is here and that God is real and that God cares so much and that God has resurrection power, that God has saving power. And that there's nothing in your life that if you looked at right now and you thought this is dead, this dream is dead, this vision is dead, this relationship is dead, my faith is dead, this hope is dead. There, if there's anything that you look at in your life and you begin to think that it's dead, no, the Bible says that there is nothing that's impossible for God. His resurrection power is able to raise, resurrect anything in your life that has been dead. Raise it to life and restore that hope. Unless, of course, you're playing church. Unless, of course, you're playing church. See, in this Bible, even dead four days isn't dead to God. It's not dead. Dead, dead is not dead to God. It's not. God speaks to dead things, and in that moment, they can live. In that moment, they'll come to life. He can speak, speak to those dead things in your life. He can speak to anything that's going on in your life. And if you'll let him bring it back to life, he wants to. He wants to. He wants to wake the dead. He wants to bring them back to life. A vision you had to make a difference. And you became discouraged and you stopped serving and stopped volunteering. What a horrible time to do that, by the way. <laughs> And of course, the enemy knows exactly what he's doing because as God's got a divine strategy with the enemy, he's got a strategy as well to destroy and kill and ruin things in your life. And he knows that there are strategic times where God places you to serve and volunteer. It's because you're not only going to make an impact for the kingdom of God, but you're going to position yourself for God to bless you as well. And if the enemy can sidetrack you and discourage you, guess what he's going to try to do? There are a lot of us that have fallen into these death traps of doubt delay 
and discouragement. What in your life is dead or been dying that you need to allow God to resurrect tonight? Bow your head and close your eyes. You know, I'm speaking from the gut here, but I bet there's a few people in here that you had at one point a hope to personally lead someone to Jesus. You came to, you came to church and you were inspired and you were excited to witness and share your faith with someone.